Good evening. President Pablo Mbeki, President Abdullahi Wad, President of Senegal, <coughs> Excellencies, Friends, a cordial welcome to the 17th meeting of the World Economic Forum on Africa. I first would like to thank all those members and partners who have been so engaged into the process we have established, a process to create better understanding for Africa and a process to create true partnerships. Let me just test and see who of you has been involved either here or in our special sessions on Africa in Davos more than 10 times. Please raise your hands. A special thank you for your loyalty. And, I, and of course, uh, I, 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 I didn't see you, um, Mr. President, raising your hand. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, a cordial welcome. And of course, I would like to greet particularly our co-chairs this year. We have an extraordinary array of experience uh, and people who will lead us through the discussions. I, um, you have here on uh, the stage already Tok Tokyo Sechwale, and you have Cynthia Carroll, the chief executive of Anglo-American, as far as Tokyo is concerned, I do not know how really I should introduce you. I, I, I could do it in different manners, um, but I will refrain from it. Um, I, um, not on the podium, I would like to welcome uh, the two other co-chairs, which show the uh, special dimension with which we want to give to this meeting. It's actually Chairman Li, who heads the Chinese Export Import Bank, and it's Malvinder Singh, the CEO of Ranbaxi, one of the most uh, or fastest growing companies in India. And of course, I have also the pleasure to welcome among us here on the stage Mrs. Uh, Essex Vesili the Vice President of the African region of the World Bank. As I mentioned, it's our 17th meeting, and you are here, if I include the media, over 1,000 people from over 40 countries. If I look at the atmosphere, and I was participating already in sessions today, you all would agree it's so different from the first years. There is much more self-confidence. There is much more true African engagement and participation. We are here at a time where Africa is growing with over 5 percent, where Africa has been more peaceful than at any time over the last 30 years. And we are here shortly after the G8 meeting, which has reassured the international commitment to Africa. But following the G8 process, and um, uh, President Mbeki and President Wad, who have been present, certainly can confirm it much better. I think there has been a great difference this time because it's a true partnership now, a true partnership where the world needs Africa as much as Africa needs the world. Before we go into the <coughs> opening session, let me just lay out some of the major changes some of the major forces, five major forces, 
which at the moment are resetting the global map. And five changes which in some way are relevant for our discussions over the next 36 or 48 hours. First, it's very clear that the world is moving into a multipolar world. More than 40% of global GDP and more than 40% of exports are generated by the developing countries. And even more important, more than two-thirds of foreign exchange reserves are held by the developing countries. We speak about the BRIC, or BRICS, and Mr. President, I always wondered what the S means at the end when people speak about the BRICS. Having prepared myself for this meeting, I now know it means South Africa. So it's not only Brazil, Russia, India, and China. It's South Africa and Africa. We also, when we speak about multipolarity, we speak about the G8, which certainly does not anymore correspond to the real uh, power, to the changing power equation which we have in our world. And I'm happy to see that this country, South Africa, holds this year the G20 presidency, the G20 even if for the moment restricted to the global financial architecture, is much more in line with the new power structure which we have in our world. The second change which I see is a change from a concept of globality to a concept of interconnectivity in the world. We have a web of regional and bi-national arrangements, more and more of FTAs, which are supplementing the multilateral system. And here, of course, Africa is on its way to become an important knot in this web structure, and particularly in the South-South relationship. A third major force, and it's related to our theme, is the global race for rising the bar. It's not only Africa which is trying to rise the bar. Every country, every country in the world is in a race to increase its competitiveness. But today we are moving into a new phase. Whereas in the past, the race for competitiveness meant mainly creating the necessary conditions for trust into the present situation by emphasizing such things as the rule of law, good governance, structural reforms, private initiative, macroeconomic discipline. Now, I think in the new phase, we have to create the necessary conditions for the future, for robust, sustained growth. And we are speaking here about capacities. We are speaking about investments, about networking, about education, about innovation. And those are the themes of our meeting this year. A fourth major force, a fourth, a fourth major change which is happening, I think, is a concept of stakeholder partnerships. We all know that neither business, nor governments, nor civil society alone can meet the challenges which we have of our, on our agenda. And here, during our meeting, we want to cultivate such partnerships, and I just take some examples the Global Health Initiative, bringing together business, civil society and governments to fight malaria, tuberculosis and AIDS, the Energy Poverty Initiative, which we will inaugurate here, and the public-private partnership, which we hope to establish 
for a green revolution for Africa under the guidance of Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General. And the last, a last element which I think is very reassuring. We have this emergence of the new champions in terms of countries, the BRICS, but we have also the emergence of new companies. Change is happening much faster. And I would bet with you that the list of the 1,000 largest companies in the world in 10 years from now will look quite different from what looks today. With fast growing companies from the developing world, and particularly also, I hope, from Africa, becoming important. The rise of the new champions, the new generation. We have here the young global leaders, and if I take the atmosphere based on my encounter with the young generation, I think we can have a lot of reasons for hope for the future, because this is a generation which is very pragmatic. Let's do it! And at the same time, a generation which has a strong commitment to the public goods. Our program, in conclusion, with its 47 sessions, will very much reflect those introductory remarks. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank my team, Heiko Arfeld, and his collaborators who have worked so hard together with our South African friends and partners to make this meeting so rich in terms of events and substance. But the success at the end will be determined by you, by your very active engagement, which takes, I'm sure, place in the spirit of the World Economic Forum committed to improving the state of the world. And I now invite Tokyo to take over and to moderate this very important first opening session. Thank you. I should indicate that uh, I'm just a moderator. Whatever that means. Uh, President Beggy says, whatever that means. I can assure you I'm not moderate. We are supposed to hold a conversation. And of course, the manner in which we are sitting here, together with yourselves, should convey the essence of a relaxed atmosphere. A conversation about our continent. Now, this, this forum, as provided by the the World Economic Forum, this conference, is a platform for sharing ideas. Quite often, critics, correctly so, sometimes not so correct, would ask as to whether this is not a talk shop. If it was, we would all not be here, because I think there is talk shop fatigue worldwide. I think we are here because, as fellow Africans and with friends who come from beyond, this platform provided by 
Davos, but on the African soil. We want to talk and celebrate our own successes. We've assembled a panel here, which consists of both government persons as well as players from the private sector. The reason we have done so is to convey the essence of the partnership. Talking about celebrating our successes presupposes that these successes are based on growth. And that growth, as Schwab was saying, has been averaged in Africa around 5.8 percent year 2006. The IMF has made a prediction that we may add another 1 percent. Now a word of caution here. It's easy to talk about Africa's growth mentioning a rounded figure. But we all well know that there are disparities. This growth is differentiated and doesn't apply equally to all African countries. So there are very fundamental and serious challenges confronting many, many other countries. For example, Angola. Angola has been averaging, it's now 17 point something percent. But take Zimbabwe, it's in the negative. So, so, so this conversation was to understand how we can go forward with building capacity in various forms so that this growth can not only be accelerated and increased, Market, it can be shared by all of us on the continent. So the platform provides a basis for a conversation of how best we can take this discussion materially forward. Years ago, it took courage on the part of President Becky. And I dare say that may be a pointer to his legacy. It took courage to stand up when it was not fashionable to do so. To state that this is Africa's century. But what we see is the Chindia approach. China and India are very bullish. So somebody can say, but how can it be our century. It took courage to speak about an African renaissance that our time has arrived when it was not fashionable to do so. And President Beggy pointed out again to the fact that there will come a day when we say Africa has risen. But it cannot rise unless and until all the requisite fundamental partnerships are integrated, crucially government, the private sector, and the communities, to realize the African Renaissance so that we can identify this as our continent, as, as our century, even in the face of the Chindia approach. We've assembled this, this panel so that we can have a conversation about building capacity. And that's the theme of this conference. Now, building capacity has been chosen out of the last address of President Becky, that is last year's plenary. Because he closed by indicating that more needs to be done around capacity. Now, capacity involves quite a number of things. 
chiefly on our continent, infrastructure. Most importantly, ICT. Very crucially, human capital development, energy development. And because we are such a huge continent, particularly sub-Sahara, with horrible land and rivers that are going into the oceans, unharnessed, the question of how to develop agriculture. So we identified capacity building arising out of the closing remarks of last year's plenary to be the theme of this conference. So, ladies and gentlemen, this, this, this conversation that we're about to start with this plenary is a follow-through, is a continuation of the story of the African dream where we ended last year. It is my honor, it is my privilege, therefore, to invite the first speaker. I'm not going to invite President Becky. He has said the tone. And I'm, I must say I'm privileged to, to, to moderate him here because the last time I did so we're underground. 17, not 17, it's about 33 years ago. He was 31, I was 21. I'm always trying to catch up with him. He was our political military commander, something that, President, I think you are shy to let, let the world know that you were a commander of some of the bad people like myself. And we used to moderate in underground discussions in closed rooms where he was imparting knowledge about how we should prepare ourselves and others for the creation of the kind of society that we have. So having moderated him when he was 31, and I was 21, and I'm still trying to catch up, I'm not going to allow him to speak first. I'll allow age to take precedent. It is therefore my privilege to ask, as our first speaker, the first panelist, President Wade, to address us. President Wade, the first question I would like to ask. Your country was quoted in the Financial Times as a success story in Africa and also as one of the oldest democracies on the continent. It was described in that Financial Times as a country in a hurry. I was recently there, this is two weeks ago, it resembles a major, a huge, large construction site. What insights would you want to share with us here around the question of capacity building as we chart our way forward? <laughs> Over to you, Mr. President. Or Monsieur le Président. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Je voudrais donc répondre à votre question en étant très précis et très bref pour permettre peut-être à l'auditoire de poser des questions. C'est vrai que le Sénégal est une success success story parce que nous n'avons pas de pétrole because we don't have oil. Nous n'avons pratiquement pas de minéraux très importants. We practically do not have important minerals. Son essentiel c'est les peanuts. Our essential production is peanuts. N'est pas très bien au plan mondial. And the price is not that high worldwide. Mais j'ai pratiqué depuis sept ans que je suis à la tête du Sénégal un modèle. But for the past seven years that I've been at head of Senegal of the repose d'abord sur les ressources humaines which is based on human resources, Ensuite, sur la créativité, and imagination and creativity, et les bonnes relations internationales and the good avec, international relations avec ceux qui ont with those who have money. Le Sénégal, est le seul pays uh, Sénégal is the only country in the world, if I'm not mistaken, qui investit 40% de son that budget invests 40% of its budget into education. 40%, I'm saying. Uh, 
le développement sustainable growth nécessite des ressources humaines. Development sustainable growth à tout moment dans l'évolution requires human resources where in any time in evolution is to be avancer. able to take control of this development and go forward. Mais si un pays se développe sans avoir les ressources humaines But capables country develops without having d'entretenir le développement, human il resources de capable à, à fronts, of maintaining that, of course, they will bump into some Je holes and stop. J'aurais pu I could have rester au niveau des investissements de l'enseignement de l'Afrique stay at the level of qui est aujourd'hui à peu près 13% of would explode into teaching in Africa which is about 13% du budget à des dépenses somptuaires and devoid the rest of the budget to sumptuary expenditures que j'ai eu aux élections and uh, était de 56% perhaps, était encore meilleur perhaps the results that i had at the election which is over 56% would have been better mais j'ai choisi de but miser I, sur l'avenir but i've decided to bet on the future la deuxième, la deuxième chose, c'est que the second thing is, um, la direction d'un pays nécessite beaucoup d'imagination. Managing a country requires a lot of imagination. J'ai lancé, je ne voudrais pas vous surprendre, près de I've 200 projets. Launched, I don't want to surprise you, I've launched over 200 projects. Depuis sept ans que je suis à la tête du Sénégal. For the past seven years that I've been at the head of Senegal. Certains sont de grands projets. Some are huge projects. Ils sont réalisés. They've been realized. D'autres sont en train d'être réalisés. Some are being realized, being implemented. Pour donner des détails. I can give you details if you wanted to. C'est pourquoi on dit que le Sénégal est un Sénégal is a big uh, construction site. Les gens travaillent. People work everywhere. Moi, je, je considère que I consider that the base of development are infrastructure. No one has ever seen a country develop without infrastructure. Uh, since I'm taking part of the G8 all the time, in January in 2000, I developed that idea all the time. Let's start with infrastructure. But um, it is only two years ago that I got understood. Now they're talking about infrastructure. But before, we were told, yes, we need good governance. You have to cure Africa from HIV, from malaria, etc. So my answer to that, which I indicated to G8 not long ago, Africa is not sick. Il y a des malades en Afrique. There are some sick people in Africa, but Africa is not sick. Dans notre continent, in our continent, there are people that are really healthy, who wants to live, who want to work, and who wants to, who wants to develop. But every time we meet with the big, huge, developed countries, the theme, the main subject matter is... HIV, AIDS, malaria, how much are we going to give there, how much are we going to give here, good governance, there's too much corruption in Africa, and so on. Africa is not corrupted. There are some corrupted people in Africa. But if there are people who are corrupted and who have capitals of money in uh, the countries of the north, in France, in uh, Geneva, in the United States, those countries know who have the money there. It's not because there are a few corrupted people that we are going to accuse Africa all the time of being corrupted. I protest against that. And then, one cannot say that Africa is ill-governed. If South Africa wasn't, was ill-governed, were we going to be here today? Senegal is well-governed. I have some colleagues here who are leading the country really well. So we take the exception and wanted to make a rule out of the exception to culpabilize us, to accuse us. That's what I do not accept. I say that I'm, I'm against HIV, AIDS. I'm fighting against that. And the prevalence rate in Senegal is one of the lowest in the world, is 0.7%. So we are fighting against it. But we don't spend all our lives talking about AIDS, 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 while we need to work. Okay? Hello.
Donc, so, je leur ai dit. So I, I told them. 0.7% of uh, uh, HIV positive. In Senegal, therefore, there is 97.03% of healthy people. So one need to take care of those people. And not only people who are sick, who of course need to be helped. The second thing I wanted to say is that I repeated, Africa is not poor. Africa has been impoverished. Slavery, colonization, domination. Everybody knows that. All of that has been developed in the MAP document, which was uh, fused with the Omega plan that I did. I'm not coming back on that, but I'm going to go to your second team because there is a link with energy matter. One cannot develop a continent if there is no energy. Africa has energy. Africa exports a lot of oil. The third American consumption is, comes from Africa. Can one understand that some African countries produce oil, a lot of oil, Algeria, Niger, Nigeria, Angola, Gabon, Congo Brazzaville. And while at the same time we in Senegal, we are missing, we, we don't have electricity. The staggering rise of oil price in 2005 brought us to raise, to, to raise the uh, oil bill. We had to pay 110 billion, 200 billion dollars that we had to pay, that we had to pay while it was not anticipated, it was not planned in the budget. So therefore it's paradoxical. The uh, barrel of oil cost 10 dollars in Angola. It cost 6 dollars in Nigeria. It is sold to me on the other side 69 $9. See, that's the problem. That is what is that. That is that oil companies make a lot of money in over Africa. The uh, countries that produce oil have also money. But we who do not produce oil, we are victimized. We, uh, I'm, not, I'm not just putting in question the uh, product. I'm a free market advocate. The countries have signed markets, that's their uh, contracts. But it is immoral to extract so much wealth from Africa while leaving poverty behind. That brought some, some uprising in the south of Nigeria, in Chad, and this is going to multiply everywhere. That's the reason why I propose to oil producers to set up a fund, oil poverty. I'm finishing, Mr. President. Just last word. Uh, See, the formula that I've established, you, will, you can see, the formula that enables to put all these uh, big matters together. So one can see the relationship. I read yesterday in The Monde a big article entitled United States, China, uh, uh, Europe, Europe, right. United States, China, and Europe are battling for the oil in the Guinea Gulf. Where is Africa in this business? <laughs> right, <is> exactly. <laughs> So we, we need, we need, we need to take part, we need to participate in it. So I'm not questioning what has been done so far, but I'm trying, I'm working on a model, and I'm going to defend this model at the level of my African colleagues for Africa to participate to the oil business, take its share in this matter. So... This amount of money received by oil companies is distributed by two shareholders who spend them into different economies in the United States, in Europe. So these are, and finally, it is the citizens of those countries that take advantage of it. And when we talk about uh, aid, assistance, I'm not talking about if it is us who are helping them, it is not known whether it is us who are help helping them. 
So all of that has to be weighed and see what comes out of it. What we are losing in this trade, is it replacing uh, truly what we call uh, assistance? Thank you. Merci beaucoup, euh, Monsieur le Président. I, I, I didn't want to provoke the President to speak French. I, I, that's all I know. I'm happy that I'm sitting away in a, a distance from President Tabombeki because the way President Ward was looking at me, it was as though by posing the questions, I'm the one responsible for the maladies. <laughs> so, Mr. President, I hope I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in your good books. I don't want to be... Please, please don't look at me when you speak. <laughs> it has taken further courage on your part, Mr. President, beside what I indicated earlier, when it's also not fashionable to do so to champion the cause of Africa right in the middle of global important forums. You have just returned from the G8. What are you saying to them about this continent that you have claimed correctly so that it must have its own renaissance and that also this is our our century you closed last year's conference with a challenge around building capacity what are you telling the world mr president over to you you do, please don't look at me mr president I'm not at all sure what it is we're telling the world. <laughs> but perhaps let me join uh, Professor uh, Klaus Schwab here uh, in saying welcome to everybody who comes from outside of South Africa. Uh, we're very, very pleased indeed that, that you are here. Uh, I, I do hope that uh, all of us are carrying some warm clothes, uh, President Monawas. I hope you got some warm clothes. This is not Lusaka. Uh, okay. But uh, let me say that the, this topic, uh, uh, building capacity for the future, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there's anything really that we can say that is new with regard to this. Uh, President Ward has uh, mentioned some of these matters critical to that capacity. I mean, here you have this continent, uh, which I think all of us are familiar with, which in, in aggregate terms uh, is identified by poverty, identified by underdevelopment, identified by as the one continent in the world which is unlikely, so it is said, uh, to, uh, uh, to meet the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals by 2015. But at the same time as President Watt said, uh, in many ways it's not a poor continent. So what is it that needs to happen, this building capacity for the future? I mean, the future we have got to talk of, future that we must speak about, obviously, must be a future of a less poor or a more prosperous continent. A more developed continent a continent that is catching up with the rest of the world. That's the future. 
And I think as Africans we have said the things that President White has just indicated. There are certain critical interventions that need to be made. One of them is the education matter uh, to which he referred a development of this human resource uh, on the continent uh, is addressed the matter of infrastructure, uh, including energy infrastructure. All of these would be part of what would go into this capacity issue. But let us say, for instance, if we said, as we should say, the majority of the population on our continent is rural. It's in the rural areas, engaged in agriculture, in subsistence agriculture. So obviously if we're talking about an Africa of the future that is growing out of poverty and underdeveloped and so on, development and so on, we must say what do we do about this agriculture? So, and when we therefore we talk about capacity for the future in a continent of that kind, that capacity must address the smart of what we do about agriculture. And then if we say that, okay, we can do the following things, whether it's, it's water or land reform or rural roads or electrification and so on, as a consequence of which you, 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 you secure household food security, produce surpluses to, to, to sell on the market, domestic market, and Inshallah, if the developed countries uh, 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 agree uh, with regard to the WTO development round, open up their markets, um, here's a possibility to export to the rest of the world. So I'm saying that if I think if we come at it like that, agriculture has got to develop. What are all of these things that you need to do in order to create the possibility for agriculture to develop? And then of course comes the question, uh, who pays? Or perhaps where do the resources come from to pay for all of this? And now Tokyo, that's part of what we discuss with the G8 and say to them that, look, we've agreed about many things. Uh, as President Watts says, uh, uh, already in 2000 he was uh, raising very sharply these questions about the importance of uh, infrastructure development. raising also very sharply these questions of education. And so, uh, one of the questions that would arise, as I was saying, who pays? Where does the money come from? If we say agriculture, uh, who does all of the training, where do you find all the money? to produce these people who are going to assist with regard to the development of agriculture. That's capacity building. And so one of the things that was agreed, and which fortunately there was action, was debt cancellation. So some of that happened. Next question that's arisen is, all right, uh, we've cancelled the debt, but these countries also need new money to pay for this development. 
African Development Fund of the African Development Bank, uh, IDA from, of the World Bank, all of these need funding. Will the money come? I don't know, but those are questions that we raise. So in, 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 in short, Chairperson, uh, 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 I'm trying to say, we have all of us identified these things that need to happen on the continent to pull the continent out of poverty and underdevelopment, develop agriculture and all that goes with it. Develop uh, agro-processing around these agricultural products to develop this industrial capacity on the continent. Huge mineral resources on the continent, mining, and value addition to those mineral products. Infrastructure around all of those things, people that you need for all of those things, the investment that you need for all of those things and perhaps that's where the people, most of the people who sit in the room come in, uh, uh, the people got money, the private sector. Uh, and in a sense, we have to listen to them more. If we say, here we've got agricultural potential, mining potential, whatever other potential, how do we persuade you to put your money here and dig a hole to simply are here? Uh, and she might very well say, build a road first so that I can get there. It's all right. That's capacity. Or supply electricity. Or supply water. Or where are the skilled people? Whatever. In that indirection, I think we'd be able and to answer this question more precisely about the capacity we need because it has to relate that capacity to the things we have to do in order to take the continent away from its poverty, away from its underdevelopment. So, I, uh, I wanted to save you, uh, uh, Tokyo, not to ask you the question, because you've never volunteered it. What is it that I need to do to attract you to take your money and invest it where I want it to go? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Carol, I, I'm happy the President was looking at you. Now, I've got Carol as well as Obi. I'm going to make a choice of which lady speaks first. Let me preface that by stating that in 1993, before the democratic election here, President Mandela was campaigning somewhere. This is his story, it's not mine. And he said he met this man during one of the ANC rallies. And this man said, but how can you allow women in your policies to be equal to us? So an old man says, I can never vote your party. And Mati was talking in the manner that he speaks. I can never vote for your party. He said, this woman said, you are taking these people. Our grandfathers and forefathers had kept them in their place. You elevate them to our level. 
I can never vote for such an organization. I am not against them. Uh, because, in fact, I'm married to seven of them. <laughs> so I'm saying, I'm going to say that I've got a black and a white lady here. I've got to make a choice who I allow first. I'll allow Obi to speak first. And Carol must know, I'm not against you. I actually sleep next to one who looks like you. <laughs> Obi, you are vice president of the World Bank. Now, besides dismissing your bosses, <laughs> you, I'm sure you have other things to do. At Tokyo, you must have been really waiting to give that joke. <laughs> I, I checked out with President Beg if I can say that. Um, there was a man here, Zulik. And according to the press, he did also meet with our Minister of Finance. Comrade Trevor is sitting there. And we read that he made certain promises about a new approach he might take. What is your view from Washington, sitting inside this bank that is focused on development, that is involved in our continent, where Zolik has made certain statements about how he sees the view of the bank in relation to Africa. You are there as an African. You have been a minister of minerals in Nigeria. You know our story, and you understand the African dream. What is the view from Washington and your perspective? I guess that what I should be giving is the view from um, partners and not to target as a view from Washington. Otherwise, I wouldn't be qualified to speak on the view from Washington. Um, Under Secretary of State for precisely, she would African be Affairs of the, the United view. States, who's the former ambassador to South Africa, Jinda Fraser is here. I think gender I would qualify to speak for, about the view from Washington, but I would speak about the view from development institutions such as the one within which I work. And that is basically to say that education is identified as very key and central uh, to the next wave of growth that we hope to see being sustained and being accelerated in the continent. And um, when you look at the, um, the, 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 the state of the continent now in terms of the growth prospects. What we're seeing is that economies that are not even dependent on oil or minerals are growing, which is an indication that Africa's growth is not being determined alone by minerals, commodities, and you know, as such like. What that therefore points us to is that Africa is beginning to do certain things right and is consistently doing those things right. Otherwise, the kind of sustained growth that we're seeing where at least 36% of the population in the continent live in countries that have grown above 5% on a sustained basis. And that is an indication that the right policy choices are working. And so going forward, how do we sustain this growth? How do we sustain this growth so that the citizens actually feel that this growth is for them? and that it's not just a statistical number. And that's where the issue of making the growth work for the people therefore comes in. How do we develop the capacities of the, of the governments to be able to distribute the, the, the growth, the, the, the dividends of the growth? How do we uh, look at the issue of education and take it beyond um, the, the just basic education and begin to anticipate that new sectors are emerging in the continent and that these new sectors that are emerging are going to need a pool of talented, competent Africans to drive the process of their emergence. How do we look at the whole infrastructure deficit that we see in the continent? Africa would require an annual investment of at least $20 billion for, for infrastructure. Where is that money going to come from? I think that that, you know, really is the question that President Mbeki was asking, that who's going to bear the cost? And I, I make bold to say that it is becoming increasingly um, evident that 
African governments are keeping their promise that they made when the discussion with the G8 happened. More and more improvements are happening in terms of good governance, in terms of right policy choices. Now what needs to happen is that the other side must come through with the promises. I put it this way, that Africa has had enough declarations that it is now the season for Africa to see action. And so that action must come from all parties. It must come from the governments identifying the most important points of investment to deepen their capacity. The work that they are doing in improving their investment climate is clearly an indication that Africa recognizes that the private sector is important for its growth. As they do this, how do we incentivize private sector to break out of their box where they are still looking at Africa as a monolithic basket case, which it no longer is? And clearly, how do we now begin to find creative financing tools that would leverage not just the kinds of resources that the World Bank and the multilateral institutions can bring to the table, but also the private sector, and then the resources of these governments. How do we deepen the uh, financial systems and the financial sector in these countries? A lot of domestic resources is important for the growth of Africa. How do we recognize that beyond the just speak about the diaspora Africans, that they constitute an incredible army of talent that would help deepen the capacity of the continent to deliver on results? So that it's not about short-term consultancies to Africa, but it's actually embedding the amazing brain, African brain, that is lying outside of the continent to Africa's development. These are the issues. And for me, I think that going through with these issues in a way that we isolate the roles and responsibilities of the different stakeholders to this dialogue is really what would determine